All right, hello everyone. Hi, good evening. This is such a fantastic crowd. Thank you all so much for coming out and joining us on this Wednesday evening. Um, my name is Amali and I'm the events director here at Books Are Magic. We are so excited to have Alice McDermott and Brandon Taylor with us tonight to celebrate the launch of Alice's newest novel and official New York Times bestseller, Absolution. <laughs> But before we get into all of that, I just have a few logistics to point out for how tonight's event is going to go. First off, we will be doing um, a hand-raised audience Q&A towards the end of the discussion, so please start thinking of questions to ask and hold on to them. After the talk tonight, Alice will be around to sign and personalize your books at the alcove next to where you checked in. We'll let you know where and when to start lining up for that. And lastly, if you're joining us virtually on the YouTube live stream, we would love to encourage you to buy a copy of Absolution online using the link in the live stream description. Okay, now let's get into this. Tonight, National Book Award winner Alice McDermott takes us to 1963 Saigon and into the lives of Patricia and Charlene, two young American wives who start an unlikely friendship. What follows is a weaving story of choice and tension and independence and the many layers of motherhood, of war, of responsibility. Alice McDermott is the author of several novels, including The Ninth Hour, Someone, After This, Child of My Heart, Charming Billy, winner of the 1998 National Book Award, and At Weddings and Wakes, all published by FSG. That night, At Weddings and Wakes and After This were also all finalists for the Pulitzer Prize. For more than two decades, she was the Richard A. Maxey Professor of the Humanities at Johns Hopkins University and a member of the faculty at the Sewanee Writers Conference. Alice lives, in, lives with her family outside Washington, D.C. As I mentioned earlier, Brandon Taylor joins Alice in conversation tonight. Brandon is the author of the novels The Late Americans in Real Life and the collection Filthy Animals. He's the 2022-2023 Mary, Mary Ellen Von der Hayden Fellow at the Dorothy and Lewis B. Coleman Center for Scholars and Writers. Okay, that is all for me. Without any further delay, please join me in giving a very warm welcome to Alice and Brandon. <laughs> Well, hi everybody. Thanks for joining us here. Um, and Alice, thank you for, for joining us and letting me talk to you about this wonderful new novel. And congrats on being a bestseller. That's, oh so, well, that's so exciting. <laughs> um, Just kind of barely. <laughs> yeah, I. that makes me so happy. I'm like, yes, real books, real books. <laughs> um, I think we, well, first of all, we managed, we were talking, we hope we come out and we don't trip. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, we we, we succeeded it. mission one of the night. <laughs> um, would you honor us with a reading? Sure. Yes. Thank you. Um, thank you all for being here. And thank you so much for uh, this thankless job of talking <laughs> about other people's books when your wonderful books are um, well worth discussing. Um, I highly recommend The Late Americans. If you haven't read it, you must. It's beautiful. Um, in so many ways. Um, actually recommended to me by one of my former students um, saying, this is all the stuff you were trying to get us to do. <laughs> 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 um, yeah, again, and thank you all for being here. Um, I'll just uh, read a little bit from uh, the opening pages so it doesn't need much set up. Um, but I do have to say, uh, in one of the interviews I had in the last few weeks, uh, the interviewer pointed out that um, all the marriages in this novel are long marriages. Uh, <laughs> and as well, in order to have a long marriage, there has to be a lot of absolution going on. Um, that, that may be part of the reason. Um, but here tonight are um, two of my oldest friends who tonight are celebrating their 49th wedding anniversary. <laughs> Jimmy and Mary Ellen. I introduced them at a rugby party at Oswego State um, 
and Jimmy immediately poured a cup of beer over Mary Ellen's head, and uh, and they've been now married for 49 years. So there's been a lot of absolution <laughs> going on. <laughs> And Jonathan Glassy is here, um, also a long marriage of sorts, who has been my editor um, since I was 26 or 27. Um, every book, 10 books altogether. And my agent, Sarah Burns, um, who is my support and my um, the person who always reminds me to laugh when I <laughs> need to be reminded. Um, so here's just, uh, without much setup, the opening pages of Absolution. There were so many cocktail parties in those days, and when they were held in the afternoon, we called them garden parties, but they were cocktail parties nonetheless. You have no idea what it was like for us, the women, I mean, the wives. Most days I would bathe in the morning and then stay in my house coat until lunch, reading, writing letters home, those fragile pale blue air mail letters with their complex folds, evidence, I think now, of how exotic distance itself once seemed. I would do my nails, compose the charming bread and butter notes we were always exchanging, wedding stationery with my still new initials, real ink, and cunning turns of phrase, bits of French, exclamation marks galore. The fan moving overhead and the heat encroaching even through the slatted blinds of the shaded room, the spice of sandalwood from the jaw stick on the dresser out for a luncheon or a lecture or a visit to the crowded market and then another bath when I awoke from my afternoon nap, damp hair on my neck as I removed the shower cap, a haze of talcum. Still wrapped in the towel, I could feel the perspiration prick my skin, face powder, rouge, lipstick, and then the high-waisted cotton underpants I hope you're laughing. The formidable cotton bra, the panty girdle with the shining diamond of brighter elastic at its center, the click of the garters, stockings slipped over the hand and held up to the light, reinforced toe and heel and top. We were careful to secure the garter just so. Too close to the nylon risked a run. You cannot imagine the troubles suggested in those days by a stocking with a run. <laughs> the woman was drunk, careless, unhappy, indifferent to her husband's career, even to his affections, ready to go home. Slip, then sheath, small white dress shields pinned under each arm with tiny gold safety pins, then shoes, jewelry, a spray of perfume. I would be faint with the heat in my column of clothes by the time I came downstairs. Peter, my husband, waiting, newly shaved, handsome in his tropical weight suit, white shirt and thin tie, having a first drink and looking a little wilted himself. And the girls we passed on the street or who met us at the door or who only moved across my inner eye by then in their white eyes were like pale leaves stirring in the humid stillness sunstruck indications of some unseen breeze, cool, weightless, beautiful. It was at a garden party on a Sunday afternoon, early in our first month in Saigon. The party was in the elegant courtyard of a villa not far from the Basilica, a lovely street lined with tamarind trees. We'd only been there a few minutes ourselves when I turned to see a young family paused at the entrance posed as if for a pretty picture beneath a swag of scarlet bougainvillea. <laughs> Baby boy in the arms of the slim mother, daughter at her side, tall father in a pale suit, another engineer, I learned later. It was much later still, decades later, 
that I suddenly wondered, laughing to think about it, why so many engineers were needed. I was 23 then, with a bachelor's from Marymount. For a year before my marriage, I had taught kindergarten at a parish school in Harlem, but my real vocation in those days, my aspiration, was to be a helpmeet for my husband. That was the word I used. It was, in fact, the word my own father had used, taking both my gloved hands in his as we waited for the wedding guests to file into our church in Yonkers. This was in the bride's waiting room, a small chamber well off the vestibule. I recall a tiny stained glass window, a kneeling bench for last minute prayer, I suppose, a box of tissue for last minute tears, on a shelf under an ornate mirror, and the two brocade chairs where we sat. The cool odor of old stone and the fresh flowers in my bouquet my father took both my hands and held them together on the wide tulle skirt of my wedding dress, which even in the dim light of the tiny room was winking with seed pearls. He said, be a helpmeet to your husband. Be the jewel in his crown. I said, I will. <laughs> I mean, do we even need to say anything else? <laughs> I <laughs> I am so in awe of your craft and of your sentences, not just for their their beauty and their their sonic qualities, but for the way that you convey a whole world, a whole sort of frame of mind just in the the turn of the sentences, we can feel Trisha's mind moving and shifting. And we know so much about this woman already before the <laughs> book has even really gotten off. And I, this is the sort of book that makes me want to give up. <laughs> because, <laughs> because not only how could I ever write that way, but also you've written the book of my heart in so many ways. So I mean, yeah, I'm just an don't give you. up. Okay. Don't give up. <laughs> just because you said that, I'm going to keep going. Um, <laughs> so, I love this novel. It is a novel of tremendous um, beauty and grace and style, but also the form of it is sneakily very, I, I think, experimental in many ways. Mm -hmm. I mean, in some sense, it's you know sort of a epistolary novel, but in other ways, it mm -mm. it functions <laughs> quite. It's very very strange the structure of this book. Um, I'd love to hear a little bit of about what was the genesis of it, mm -hmm. both the story and how did you work your way into into this form that it takes on? Sure, great, thank you. Um, yeah, I mean, it's it's not really epistolary because nobody would ever write a letter yeah. that long <laughs> and, and nobody would read it if you did. Um, in some ways, uh, this is sort of a, there, there are two narrators, um, memoirists, looking back at this year in, in 1963, their time in Saigon. Trisha, who I just read her voice, um, and then Rainey, who was that little girl in that pose tableau of that family. Um, and so there's a, there's some of my students here, and so they're, they're going to roll their eyes because I've probably, they've already heard me say this so many times. There was a wonderful, wonderful story by Isaac Dennison called The Blank Page. Um, and in the story, the, there's a storyteller who says, when you're true to the story, uh, the silence at the end of the story says more than the story itself can ever say. Um, and I love that, and, I, and that's what I look for, and that's what I respond to in your work and, and all the novels that I love, that you, language takes you up to that place um, that it the moment it fails. Um, and if it takes you the, in the right way, then the blank page, the space break, the chapter break speaks. Um, so in some ways, I'm getting to, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm doing a Trisha. I'm like, I'm getting to your, <laughs> to your question. But in some ways, this novel has silence before it begins. Um, and that is the character of Rainey, who was this little girl, contacting Trisha and saying, from the present, more or less, um, do you remember me? 
do you remember my mother? Do you remember those days in Saigon? Um, that's the unspoken question that's there before the novel begins. And what I just read to you, the opening pages, it, that's Trisha's response. Um, and I, I sort of understood, for, for whatever I understood about Trisha before I really did a lot of writing, one thing I did understand about who she was the generation she was from, she came of age, uh, only child, um, Irish Catholic Yonkers coming of age in the 50s, um, that she would not tell her story unless she had been asked. Um, this is not the sort of character who's going to write her memoirs and start sending it out to editors. <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, this is the sort of character who um, feels, oh, you don't want to hear about that. Um, oh yeah, well, it was kind of interesting, but I won't bore you with my life. Um, so I knew that somebody had to evoke her turn as a memoirist. Um, and then I knew, of course, if, if she is gonna go on for all these pages, the person who asked the question has to be able to respond. So um, yeah, I understood, yeah, it's not letters, it's, but it is in some faux way of an exchange. Um, of the written word. Yeah, yeah. An exchange of the written word about um, a, a shared experience in a way. Right. Um, although I feel like one of the projects of the novel is to illuminate that, you know, it's possible that two people can share a moment, but to sort of be constructing and their experiencing of it, like two drastically different, um, of two drastically different records of what happened. Yes, right, right. And two drastically different generations. Um, you know, I won't be the first to notice that 1963 was, was really a pivotal year <laughs> in many ways and on the precipice. So to, to be 20, a 23-year-old newlywed mm. in 1963 um, and then to go on and live the rest of your life into the 80s makes your, your experience very different than to be an eight-year-old in 1963. Um, the the woman's movement was coming, um, and but Trisha was already formed without it. Um, the Vietnam would become something that n none of these people imagined it would become um, for the eight-year-old. So it's that, and it always fascinates me. It's not um, it's not just the memory. It's not just the thing that happened. Um, that was an interesting time to be in Saigon. <laughs> um, but it's how the memory changes and becomes a kind of storytelling um, when it's seen through, um, through any number of years, from 10 decades, a, a decade away, um, 10 decades away. And one of the things I, I love about it, so you, you sort of told us that there are these two narrative threads, these two narrators, Rainey and Trisha, but it's not even that it's like a, a sort of directly chronological account, right? As Trisha is telling us about life in Saigon in this kind of almost like colonial outpost. <laughs> yes, um, yeah. um, as she's telling us about that, she's having these sparks of memory now. She's drawing these connections between that time and earlier periods in her life. And so right. there are all the there are also these stories about um, that year in New York or or her friend Stella and yes. their their sort of foray into social <laughs> justice. And so the memory becomes manifold in some way, becomes quite sort of multi multi front war. Trisha is fighting against the past. It's true, yeah. And and then there's also the that that sense of um, Irony is very gentle on Trisha's part of, um, can you believe we were like that? Yeah. Um, you know, can you believe uh, at one point um, Trisha is pregnant and she goes to a Navy doctor in Saigon and the doctor assures her, why don't you just stay here and have your baby here in Saigon? Because, and, and for the rest of your life, your, your son's girlfriends will be running to an atlas to see where is this strange, exotic place where he was born. <laughs> Vietnam, in 1963, he was thinking, by the time this baby, 20 years from now, people will have to go to atlases to, um, so Trisha relates these things with the awareness of, can you believe we thought that? Yeah. <laughs> <You know? laughs> um, so we've mentioned Saigon a bit. Um, I'm curious, when you set out to write word one of this book, did you know that's where it would be set? Did the setting come first and then you found the characters or was it some other force that called to you? <laughs> um, yeah, I would, 
two two things um, that that sort of got this this entire story going. Um, one happened many many years ago. Um, at Oswego State, on the shores of Lake Ontario, the first time I read Graham Greene's The Quiet American. Um, so this would have been in the early 70s. Vietnam was still very much a part of our lives. Saigon hadn't actually fallen yet. But I remember reading it and just being blown away by how politically prescient Graham Greene was. I mean, he called it. This is, you, you guys, you Amer you're going to mess up. It's going to be awful. You shouldn't do this. Um, and Quite American was published in 55 or 56. Um, I remember thinking as a 19 year old, did JFK read The Quiet American? <laughs> did Lyndon Johnson read The Quiet American? <laughs> I mean, it's all mapped out. Don't do this. But I also realized, first time reading it through, um, that all the women in the novel were shallow. Mm. Um, and and Graham Greene did not see the women's movement coming. <laughs> you know, he got Vietnam right. Uh, um, yeah, he did not. Gloria Steinem was not in his uh, in his sights. Um, and there, there's one scene in particular uh, of two American young American girls in a milk bar in Saigon that Fowler, the uh, the grizzled. British journalist who's the narrator of The Quiet American, uh, glances over at them and, uh, and he thinks about how clean they look and how uncomplicated their lives must be. Um, at one point he said they, when they get up, one of them looks at him directly. It wasn't a woman's look, it was a man's look. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and, and then you can't even, he's, he's thinking, oh, you can't even imagine pa you know, that they have passions. You can't think of the sweat of sex on them. Their lives are nothing like mine, which is so passionate and full of sweat and sex. <laughs> um, um, and even as a 19-year-old, I was thinking, two American girls in their early 20s in Saigon uh, having ice cream. These are fascinating women. Are you kidding? What are they in 55 or 54? Mm -hmm. um, so that always, by, and, and you know, since I, I taught the novel, I've read it any number, um, so I always thought, eh, he didn't get that right. And then living inside the Beltway as an adult, and so many times I would run into, in social occasions or carpool lines, um, women a little bit older than myself who could have been those very girls who had these fascinating lives or whose husbands were there doing all kinds of nefarious things and they were having teas and um, doing charity work. Um, so, th so that was sort of kept the idea of that somebody has to say something about these women. Um, and then at one of these little social gatherings, I was chatting with a woman who indeed was in Saigon in 1963, and she mentioned that she and her friends sewed little Barbie doll outfits and sold them. And when she said that, I had this recollection of being a kid in Elmont, Long Island, and being sent with my little Barbie case to go play with a girl who must have been new to town. I don't know, it was a play date that was arranged. And she had a Barbie wearing, uh, I didn't know what it was called. It was just, you know, a very exotic, long, it was white, it was long, it had the pants. And I con had completely forgotten about that until she said it. So, you know, that, that uh, sort of ripple across time, a kind of vague connectedness mm. that we love yeah. when we're making up stories. <laughs> <Yeah>. you <know? laughs> so I knew it was Saigon, uh, and I knew I had to write an origin story for a Barbie doll um, mm. in 1963 wearing an Ao Yai. So all this came out of that? <laughs> wow, you're such a good novelist. That's so incredible. Um, I, I have so many follow-ups. Um, so how do you get then from a Barbie to, I mean, I can see how you get from that to Charlene, but how do you get yeah. from that to a, to a Trisha? Yeah, um, well, actually, Charlene um, sort of burst. Uh, Trisha, I kind of understood. Um, again, just the this, you know, I know her background, you know, there, a few people have said, oh, you know, I, I, I've really gone into a whole new category of writing now because I'm writing about Saigon in 1963. Oh. And I'm like, she's Irish Catholic from Yonkers. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> it's not new, you know. And Rainey grew up in Garden City, Long Island, for God's sake. And she moved to Maryland, where I live now. Are you kidding? Just because I, I anyway. <laughs> They're welcome to say that. I appreciate it. <laughs> um, but but Charlene um, 
as a type sort of burst into I was really just trying to write the origin story um, and see how I this this little object that sort of seemed to float through time and make odd connections um, and Rainey's mother um, just appeared yeah. um, and I didn't like her at first and then I knew it was my obligation mm -hmm. to find out more about her and try to both for Tricia and for Charlene um, try to somehow appreciate their complexity as human beings, even though they're both types of a sort. Yeah, were you ever tempted to, I mean, because there are moments where Charlene, this sort of, this force, the dynamo, uh, <laughs> yeah. as she's called in the book, this sort of galvanizing, organizing force at the center of this social world that these women inhabit, there are moments where she almost seizes control of the book. <laughs> yes, um, yeah. Were you ever tempted to let her uh, uh, <laughs> run away with this novel? <laughs> um, she probably would have liked to, yeah. Um, yeah. It would have been a very different book. It would have been a very different book. I mean, I'm, I was willing to give her her full humanity. I was not willing to give her the full book. <laughs> yeah. No, Neva, I couldn't stand that either. Yeah. No, but what, what she became sort of interesting to me because, um, you know, I did, Trisha's reaction to her is, ah, oh, I know her type. She pushes girls like me around, um, which she does. Um, she says right away, she tells Trisha that the American wives in their little cohort, um, they're all tired of her because she's smarter than all of them. Mm -hmm. um, but I also thought, you know, she, this is a warrior too, you know? I mean, she is so sure of herself. Um, and yet what she wants to do is beyond possible. She wants to relieve suffering. Mm -hmm. um, she at, at one point Trisha described she she says the word uh, suffering and she, I mean suffering, and Trisha said it's it's like she was referring to someone who wore white shoes after Labor Day. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's, it's uh, she's so annoyed at it. It stop that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, yeah. we have to fix that. Um, and and so the more and more I said, well, yeah, she wants to. She really does want to repair the world. Um, it's not to her liking. Um, there's lots of things not to her liking. She doesn't like the way a lot of people behave. She certainly doesn't like the way a lot of people dress. Mm -hmm. um, but take that a little further. Um, she, she doesn't like suffering. Mm -hmm. um, and she's going to fix it. She doesn't like creation. She's going to fix it. Um, at one point she says when the, there, when the whirlwind throws chaos at you, uh, you throw it back. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, so... She could have taken over the book, but oh my God. <laughs> yeah, I, I, Graham Greene would have blushed had Charlene <laughs> taken over this novel. <laughs> I mean, she, yeah, there are all these, I mean, she really is this this force that shapes so much of what happens in the book. I, I feel like there are moments where Trisha is almost reeling on, on the back foot from her. But at the same time, as you say, she wants to alleviate suffering and she's capable of these like, breathtaking moments of generosity and right. care. I yeah. mean, she's there for Trisha at a particularly difficult and brutal moment in the book. And and that passage moved me so much. I had to like close the novel and take a take a break. Uh -huh. um, and so I find that I find her fast. She's one of those characters who I think will stay with me for a long time just because she is so real in her complexity. Yeah. And, and I think um, when her daughter takes over the narrative, mm -hmm. when Rainey tells her part of it, um, it sort of, it hurt my feelings on Charlene's behalf mm -hmm. that Rainey um, is very, is mean to her mother. Yeah. Rainey um, still has issues with her mother even though her mother um, has passed. And there's one opportunity um, Th that Rainey really kind of makes a record. It's for her mother's obituary, and she throws a line into her mother's obituary. Um, that struck me as sad and cruel. And I think, in retrospect, she admits yeah. she probably shouldn't have done it. Um, and that sort of hurt me for Charlene because mm -hmm. I think the Charlenes of the world, that is the final word about them. You know, um, with the, there's one point that uh, Rainey describes um, Charlene later in life when, when Rainey is a, a teenager into adult years that her, when her mother was, was looking and dressing like Nancy Reagan. That's not a compliment. <laughs> <laughs> no. uh, but she was bringing 
baskets of goodies mm. into the city for AIDS patients um, to bring something beautiful to young men who were dying. Mm. And, and I sort of feel like the, the Nancy Reagan look right. is, is her legacy and not the, but I'm, I, wanna, uh, I wanna bring beauty to, to yeah. people who have no hope. Um, so that sort of hurt me. Um, so I think in some ways I wanted to redeem Charlene even if her own daughter um, yeah. hadn't been able to forgive her. Yeah, but that's the, the sort of like brutality of being a writer is that you have to let the characters enact their little cruelties even though you're sort of watching them and going, no, 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 <laughs> right, no, exactly. no, no, don't do, it's oh, much more do that. no, right. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> And then there's the feeling, I knew you were gonna do that. <laughs> oh yeah, when it happens, I'm like, ooh, yeah. I mean, she kind of had it coming, but yeah. ouch. Yeah, right, 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 right. <laughs> um, so it's set in Saigon. Saigon is such a, um, a palpable setting in this book. And yet the the war, the engineer, the men are so shadowy and so <laughs> at a distance, except for, I think, except the way that those men and the, the sort of harsh realities of the situation impinge upon the most vulnerable. Mm -hmm. I, I feel that the book sort of marks the war and marks the conflict on the, the sort of brutality that the children and the women face and the displaced people face. Right. Um, how did you come to that decision on how to, what part of that to let into this book? Because of course, you know, like them being these American wives abroad, there was that sense of like, no, no, we must protect them. And, and so they do live in an enclave and yet yes. it does sneak in. Yeah, and, and, and in some ways they seek it. Um, uh, Trisha and, and Charlene, you know, um, because they want to do good right. in the world. Um, Charlene's motto is sort of, I want to do good, but it takes money. <laughs> um, so that's sort of the, the, you know, the, the, the good angel and the bad angel um, part of her. But, um, but yeah, and again, 63, um, you know, Vietnam was very, we really were on the precipice of, of so many things. Um, so it, it wasn't a stretch for the women to be less than aware um, of what this particular posting was going to lead to. Um, and it was also the times, you know, um, that, that men did not feel obliged to share what they were up to. Um, and I had heard so many stories from w women of that generation. As a matter of fact, I was down at the, um, the Carter Library um, and uh, the curator there was telling me that um, Rosalind Carter found out that Jimmy was running for the state house when he came out of the bedroom one morning wearing a suit. And she said to him, is there a funeral? And he said, no, I'm running for a state house. He hadn't told her. Um, <laughs> yeah. But it was that era, you know, it was that, um, you know, that time and place. Just an aside, there was also a book at the Carter Library that Jimmy had given to Rosalind before they were married called How to Be a Navy Wife. <laughs> and they have it opened under a glass case with, he had underlined, oh, no. a Navy wife must be slim and willowy. Oh. A Navy wife must have just a slight wave in her hair. <laughs> and my favorite, a Navy wife must have pretty teeth. Oh jail, jail, <laughs> send them to jail. So yeah, oh my God. times have changed. Barely, nope. just a smidge, um, <laughs> just, I mean, and, and that shows up again and again, right? I mean, yeah. e even when, you know, Peter, Trisha's husband, making all sorts of decisions about their lives without consulting her. No, right. um, that sort of horrifying moment in the book where Carolyn Kennedy is the last person on earth to know that she had missed Jacqueline. Yes. Jacqueline, yes. 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 I mean, I may, I mean, yeah. breathtaking, yeah. breathtaking, horrifying stuff. Um, I would be remiss. Um, I told the internet I would ask you about this. Um, <laughs> I was raised Baptist, but I love getting into Catholic stuff. Um, <laughs> I spent a great deal of my time. Well, you came to the right place. <laughs> I, I spent, I spent the weekend at a conference for Catholics at Catholic University. Uh -huh. um, so Catholicism obviously is sort of big theme 
subject, uh, part of your work. And it shows up to no one's surprise again in a book called Absolution. (laughs) Um, What I found, I mean, I found many things interesting about Catholicism broadly, but what I found interesting about it here was how, not how simple Trisha's faith is, Mm -hmm. because I don't think that that's true, but the ways that you sort of just, you as a writer have such a, a, a natural facility for capturing the the inner spiritual life of your characters without any sort of ostentatiousness without mm-hmm. you capture the the sort of every the everyday dailiness of of a sort of quietly spiritual life and its importance in the lives of of these characters especially and particularly in this situation where so many of the catholics <laughs> The Catholic element on Vietnam was a thing I had not considered before mm-hmm. I read this. Um, could you speak to the role of Catholicism in Trisha's life? Sure. Uh, particularly because it does seem also freighted with class and freighted mm-hmm. with the times. Yes. Um, yeah. yeah. Very much so. Yeah. I mean, um, well, there's also just the, the the politics, the reality of the time. Um I wanted to be really careful um, trying to write from the point of view of a person from another generation with different experience of my own about a time that we all know how it turned out. Um, So I made a real effort to try to understand um, the the men who thought they were there doing the right thing. Um, And so it was very uh, apparent to me um, that Peter, Trisha's husband, um, being a born and bred Irish Catholic himself, um, would see Catholic president in the United States, a Catholic president in Vietnam. Um, and he has a firm, absolutely unquestioning faith that um, Mary, the mother of God, appeared in a full body completely clear in a field in Portugal Mm. um, during the First World War and told three small children that communism must be defeated and that if they dedicate them, that the world would dedicate themselves to her, that communism would indeed be defeated. Um, So he's the sort of Catholic who takes that very seriously. Um, This in his mind, in his faith, this really happened. So to be, a, as a young, a bright man, um, up and coming, going to law school, out of a working class family, um, to be given the opportunity to work at stopping communism in this time and place would feel like a directive from his God. Um, and not with any arrogance, but just this is the right thing to do. And, and Trisha's um, faith, which is not quite that complicated, she kind of says, and my faith was that he was right. Yes. If my husband says this is the right thing to do, my faith in him was so great that I agreed. Um, but, but just that, you know, that sense of, yeah, we all now know what a mess you made of it. Um, and in some ways, I guess, you know, in, in, quiet, in the quiet, Amer- the quiet American, in the quiet American is such a jerk. <laughs> there, you know, you know, he's a jerk from, from the first time he appears. Um, and well, he doesn't end up so good, but that's all right. But I didn't want to make uh, Peter or the, his, his belief set. Um, indicative of what a jerky was um, so so that but that was tied in to faith um, that was tied into what he really believed um, so into the the story then also came as I was composing it um, well if you got a character who really believes that um, a fully, fully physical woman who gave birth to the savior of the world, (laughs) really did touch down in this field in Portugal and tell the world what the world needed to. Um, What about the other side of this? Do any any of these people think the devil also appears embodied in this world of such clear good and evil? Um, So, yeah. Yes, he does. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yes. I, you, you talking about Peter there brings to mind one of my favorite lines of the book where Peter, I think years later, is thinking about 
that and he goes you know i don't think that they really believed that but they made useful fools of us who did did, um and i underlined that and then posted it to instagram and i was like this is so amazing but i mean it does feel (laughs) (laughs) it does feel that that is a thing that still happens you know that, that idea that we live in a world where the powers that be are increasingly good at making useful fools of us who believe, you know, that we can make the world a better place or that we can, um, that we can sort of through our actions improve the common good of man. And, and, and there are all these horrifying insidious systems that are good at manipulating that. And and in that way, this book is (laughs) really depressing because things haven't changed (laughs) very much. Um, but I also want to talk before we open up to questions a little bit more about the way that Trisha's pay, faith is directed Mm -hmm. because yes it is directed in that sense of like she wants to be the help meet Mm -hmm. but it also seems that she is her faith is directed in these like more like more humble in some way like pragmatic things like she wants to teach and help students she wants to alleviate suffering she wants to do the right thing it's just that she isn't always sure that she can trust her own sense of what that is exactly right right and and charlene kind of pushes her to you know it's fine to bring lollipops to the children's hospital i can do that as long as the children aren't suffering too much because that's really hard to see Um, and then charlene uh, brings her i'm not giving anything away to a leper colony Um, and and trish is really um maybe this is a bit too much, um, too much to do. Um, and, you know, I think it's, it is that, that sense of, and I'm sure much of this novel in some way was infected by the, the way certain people are manipulating uh, the faithful um, in our given moment, um, but also the certainty yeah. That with which we believe things left and right, we are all we are all pointing our fingers and saying, "No, I know you're wrong. No, I know you're wrong." Um, and you know, there's a lot of uncertainty here. The the even someone like Peter, years later, says they didn't. Be- I believed it, but they didn't. Um, and Charlene's um, confidence about what she can do for the world also recoils a little bit because she wants to keep her own children safe. And that becomes sort of the question, um, do you go out and repair the world or do you circle the wagons around your own little world um, and and keep that safe? Um, And I think Rainey and Trisha ultimately, that's that's all they try to do. Look, I'm just going to Domestic happiness is all I can ask for. Um, And the world and chaos will have to take care of itself. Yeah, and sometimes only just. You can only just secure your domestic happiness. <laughs> yeah. um, when you were saying that thing earlier that someone had said this book is full of long marriages, and I was like, yeah, but like that doesn't guarantee happiness. No. <laughs> Those marriages, <laughs> they're long but not easy marriages. <laughs> um, do you guys have any questions for us? We have qu- time for you guys to ask questions. Yes. I, want, I just want to say I love all your books so much. Thank you. I once read somebody said about Graham Greene that he had like an unfair advantage because his characters, some of them, truly believed like in damnation. Mm. That yeah. their soul could go to hell. And yeah. It gave the meaning, the moral stakes of the book, something that the average, another writer wouldn't get to have. Right. Do you feel um, that you also maybe have a little... That, oh, when I'm going to, that something gets a little lost when you don't have that um, uh, people sort of living in those past beliefs that are sort of disappearing now. Yeah. That, I'm going to repeat yeah. the question for the audi- the stream people. So the question was, um, do you have an unfair advantage <laughs> writing characters who have belief systems versus characters who, who don't sort of bot- subscribe to a, a belief system or a faith system as a writer? Um, probably. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I, th- I think. Perhaps it's something to um, to fight against. It's something to worry about um, if it's not going well, um, and and certainly again the, um, it, it, in this novel um, th- there is uh, that confrontation with 
um, embodied evil as well as a belief in embodied goodness. Um, and uh, uh, th I, th I think there, there, if you can believe in the miracle, the good miracle, um, then you um, have the capacity to believe in the nightmare. Um, uh, the the scary stuff. You, you, in some ways, you can't. You can be skeptical of the good miracle and and dismiss uh, the 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 embodiment of evil. But once you say this is possible, then it seems that you're tied to saying this is possible. Um, and 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 I do think that's um, that makes for a um, a clear. At least it gives a language for the moral dilemmas that we all face. Mm -hmm. um, but but this, this gives a metaphor, a language, um, and, and, and appeals to the imagination because uh, we're talking about real people. We're talking about there's a guy who comes out of the jungle and he's filthy and he's uh, creepy um, and yet maybe really good and yet maybe he actually is Satan um, or maybe he's just the CIA, <laughs> you know. <laughs> um, but but to, to, you, Catholicism gives me as a writer a language for the inner lives of my characters um, and that's the best thing it does for me. Um, not to say that there aren't many other languages that, that can get at that, but it's handy. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Listen, oh yes, here we are. You know, I, I just got back from a trip with my sister to Vietnam in March, ah. and I'm just curious, did you visit Vietnam as part of writing the novel? As, um, because your description is spot on that you read uh, about, you know, the trees and um, the basilica. I mean, at least what's standing now. Right. I mean, obviously, I have no idea what it looked like in 1963. Right. So did you visit Vietnam? No, I did not, but you thank you. <laughs> I'm glad <laughs> you did it for me. Thank you. The details that you provided are spot on. You know, I thought initially when I was, you know, getting this first, just getting that that whole Barbie origin story going, I thought, oh, I've always wanted to go to Vietnam. Um, obviously, as you did too, right? Um, and here's my excuse, tax write-off. I can say it's research. Um, you know, and then COVID came along and it was either I was going to put the book aside. Um, but it struck me right away, just as you said, Saigon literally is no longer on the map. And, and none of us can go back to Saigon in 1963. Um, so, so what I did, and mostly it was through the first lockdown, summer lockdown of, of COVID, um, I went to my shelf and I reread everything about Vietnam that I loved, um, starting, of course, with novels. Um, uh, Tree of Smoke was a novel that really just sort of put me right back in the world, what it feels like. Of course, they're mostly war novels, Tim, all of Tim O'Brien's mm -hmm. work, Robert Stone. Um, and then I went back to some of the memoirs. Again, all war stories, very, very little from any woman's point of view. Um, even the few war correspondents who were there, they were reporting in the same way that most of the men were. But I just read, not quite knowing what I was looking for, but realizing, you know, some of the most profound and memorable experiences of my life I've gotten through novels, not through travel. <laughs> you know, they're, they're vivid. And if there's anything that I forget about them, I can go right, I don't have to, mm -hmm. I don't have to look for that photograph that I took to remind me. I can go right back to the book and live it all over again. So in some ways it was freeing not to have to have had my own experience in the place, um, but to absorb it and then hope that whatever my characters needed was somewhere in my consciousness because of wonderful writers who brought me there. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Have you heard, since you've write, written the book, have you heard yet from women who, who worked in Saigon, American women, are they related to that? Yes, I ha as a matter of fact, the, the same woman who told me about they made little um, Barbie doll outfits when she was a wife uh, in Saigon, um, sent me a bunch of pictures um, th that that she had from them, and she just said, "See, you got it all right. It's just this yes! is this is your scene. She could have been. I mean, just um, uh, and and I 
the only thing just between us? <laughs> like, the men were not good looking. All the American men looked uh, awful. You know, it was that <laughs> terrible time. They had bad haircuts and yeah. they all had like the wrong glasses. And I'm like, oh, my men are much better looking. <laughs> I did I did feel that when I was reading. I was like, wow, she really, because I did do some Googling and I, I was like, wow, you really <laughs> gave them a much improved glow up. <laughs> right. Oh, good, yeah, right. <laughs> the women look fine even with their beehives and, you know, and their French twists. You know, they look kind of elegant, boy the men and then you find out this guy's only 30 he looked like he is 60 men's fashion was not not this not is, in the state department this, this is not the time no <laughs> Right. Jack gets assassinated in 64 Gulf of Tonkin. In 65, 500,000 Americans in Vietnam. And it, it became all war. Exactly. Right. Yeah. And that was, I mean, th that's what kind of incredible year that was. Um, but so um, that was my hardest. So, and when I was trying to get Peter, the um, maybe CIA <laughs> uh, operative, Trisha's husband, um, I, f I felt I had to um, have some sense of the justification that these people felt. He was not really moved by the Buddhist suicides because, um, and, and this was the case that was being made um, by the, now we know they were war hawks, um, that uh, he, these were communist infiltrators who were trying to turn the West away from what was happening in Vietnam. Um, so rather than um, the, the Buddhists were making a statement trying to get the U.S. out um, from the, what we would call the conservative side, they were saying, oh no, this, that Buddhist monk was drugged and he was uh, an operative for the communist who had infiltrated uh, the Buddhist uh, temples in Saigon, and um, and and I found evidence. People, why was the AP photographer there? Why had he been called? Um, how was how convenient was that? That um, and it was the New York Times was on the wrong side. They were saying, see, this is a terrible thing. But the conservative American view was, no, this is evidence that we we need to stay. Um, so again, to have sympathy for the guy who believed that. Um, mm -hmm. Peter's saying, no, I know about Buddhism. They wouldn't, they don't, you know, the cliche at the time was Buddhists wouldn't kill a biting flea. They, you know, a Buddhist would not self-immulate like that. Um, that's, that's completely against everything I understand about Buddhism. It must be the communists who've, who've caused it. Amazing. <laughs> <laughs> I could listen to you deep dive Vietnam conspiracy <laughs> theories all night. <laughs> that is, I want to know what else you found in the archive, but we are, we are taking other, two, great, two more questions. <laughs> Guys, I mean, one of America's greatest oh. <laughs> is, Well, the other, and you refer to the other interesting thing that I had a very vague memory of because my mother worshiped Jacqueline Kennedy, obviously. My grandmother thought she had given birth to JFK. Um, <laughs> <laughs> she was in the front row at his inauguration, came from Dean Street to Washington and sat in the front row in the snow, never felt the any cold because it was JFK and he was president. Anyway. <laughs> Um, I had a vague recollection um, of 63 when Jacqueline mm -hmm. Kennedy lost her, the baby she had just given birth to, uh, Patrick Bouvier Kennedy. And I remember my mother being upset about the press conference at which his death was announced. He only lived a few days. And I found it on YouTube, and it was exactly what I feared. Pierre Salinger came out to the press to say, I mean, the whole world, I remember as a kid, you know, the child had been born, then it, it was flown to uh, Children's Hospital in Boston. JFK went to be with the child. Bobby was there. Pierre Salinger came out 
for the press conference to announce that the child had died, um, said, you know, his full name and the hour of death, and there was a sympathetic gasp from the press corps. And the question came, has Mrs. Kennedy been told? And Pierre Salinger said, no, not yet. Wow. Oh That's what I said. <laughs> <laughs> Oh my God! I yeah, I screamed. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So you, that was yeah. the world. Yeah. That was the world. Um, it was just a different world. So I had to put that. Yeah. <laughs> Listen. Uh, yeah, and Trisha's like, I know you can't believe it, right? But yeah, it happened. I <laughs> swore you made that up, and then <laughs> and then I also found it on. Yeah, it, yeah, amazing, incredible. One more question now. <laughs> Any questions? Speak now, forever hold your peace. Yes. Uh, thank you so much for the reading. That was beautiful. Um, I thought it was really interesting how you were talking about the difference between like the Yeah, um, the ironic thing is I have had um, women who've read the book come to me and say, I have a 23-year-old daughter and she's so much younger than Trisha was in 1963. Like, married and going off with her husband to say, God, you know, she's not even, she hasn't left house yet, you know? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, she doesn't know if she, you know, what she wants to do with her life. And so, in some ways, there, there's something very ironic about this was a generation of women who were dependent on their husbands, whose goal was to be a helpmeet, to be the jewel in his crown, let him be the professional, let him have a, um, I will take care of the house, I will have the children, um, rather than, ah, you know, I don't know if I want to have children, and I don't know if I really want to get married, and uh, maybe I'll just stay with my roommates for a long time. <laughs> um, and so it is this mixture, and it was really important to me, just sort of like um, trying to understand the political mindset of Trisha's husband, um, who was there in Vietnam and, and convinced that what they were doing there, stopping communism, was absolutely the right thing to do. Um, I, I didn't want to denigrate her sense of herself. And I didn't want her to look back and say, what an idiot I was. So a couple of times when she's, when she's telling Rainey about who she was, um, she's like, you know, it was pretty great to be newly married and a virgin when you're married. Those first few months, sex for the first time, newlywed sex, it was fabulous. Um, I feel sorry for your generation. Um, you know, because you don't have that, that amazing, special, now you're married and there's this whole new world you've never experienced before. Um, so she talks a little bit about, um, and at one point too, she, she says, um, you know, b having been raised Catholic and warned about if the communists take over, you know what's going to happen? All women are going to have to go to work and they're going to have oh. to drop their children off at government-run daycare. <laughs> <laughs> and all the old people, because there's not going to be any women at home to help take care of the old people, they're all going to go into places just filled with old people, <laughs> dropped off there. And, she, and she's, these are all the things that they were threatened with. And then she kind of thinks for a minute and she says, uh, you know, I'm living in an assisted living place that's all old people. And um, the churches also, the threat was churches would be closed down. And the church where I was married is a condominium now. <laughs> um, and, and women go to work and, and drop their, ch you know, so like the communists didn't win, but we kind of ended up in the same place anyway. Um, so it's just allowing the character to have affection for her past life, even in all its wrongness. Something you haven't really talked about, what the but having a child is such a big issue in the novel, and uh, as it turns out, Trisha can't have a child, mm -hmm. and, she, and the whole in some ways the plot of the book turns on that issue, and I wonder how would you say that the issue of 
having a child relates to the politics of the story or can you mm. say something about that? Yes, do you want to do the live stream? <laughs> oh, so the question is about the role of children in the book right. and the role of having a children and how the plot turns on that and how the politics of the novel impinge upon this question of child birthing and having children. Yeah, and and I mean it it, it starts with that Trisha again because she she and her husband are marching into the upper class. Um, he's well, he's marching and she's going to go along with him as the helpmeet. Um, and, but her role is is home and children. Um, so uh, she has her first miscarriage in Saigon, um, and suddenly her faith in her role is shaken. Um, but along with that is uh, Charlene, who has three children. Um, uh, Charlene is aware of um, the the failure of the larger world, culture, society to place any value on children. Um, that's why she's going to children's hospitals and try. Um, so Charlene, um, in a sort of questionably moral way is saying um, if someone wants to sell you their child and I have somebody who wants to buy the child and get them out of this country and give them a life that might be good and prosperous is that a bad thing um, and so up against Trish's inability to conceive her own child, there's kind of this insidious, yeah, but look at all the children here. The streets are full of children. Um, have one of them. What's wrong with that? Um, and so Trisha, in her own sense of failure to, to keep up her part as helpmeet in that regard, um, is also um, led to question um, is that if we're going to take these children away from their mothers, but maybe that would be a good thing yeah. for the children. So uh, the, her own inability, I, I think, uh, shakes up her sense of herself. It shakes up her sense of her life uh, ahead. Um, but it also, with Charlene's guidance, um, makes her question, um, why is my own child any more valuable than this child crying um, in the children's, abandoned in the children's hospital. The children, the in, inconsolable girl child who's like yes. sobbing in that first hospital yeah, visit. Yeah, yeah, just the, um, yeah, what value? What value do they have? And Charlene has the right to ask that. Um, I think we're all aware of that, especially these days. Um, what, what value on the life of living children? Um, when do we say that's the most important thing? Yeah. That's a very heavy note to end on. <laughs> <laughs> well, on that note, um, <laughs> thank you so much. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. Thank you. <laughs> yes, thank you all so much for coming out tonight. Thank you to everyone who asked questions. Thank you to Brandon, of course, for moderating such a great conversation, always knowing exactly what questions to ask. And of course, thank you to Alice for celebrating such a wonderful launch thank with you. us. Thank you for having me um, here. Thank you for coming. So just a few quick reminders before we fully wrap up. If you're still with us on the live stream, you can buy a copy by clicking the link in the live stream description. For those of you with us tonight in store, um, if you'd like to get a copy or an additional copy, we have plenty of um, those books available up at the front register where you checked in. We also have copies of Alice's novels, The Ninth Hour and Charming Billy, which if you haven't read yet, what are you waiting for? And if you have, well, the holidays are coming up, so now's your time to stock up on those signed books. We also have some copies of Brandon's most recent novel, The Late Americans, which absolutely wrecked me, and I say that as the highest compliment <laughs> ever. So I highly recommend you check those out as well. Alice will be around to sign and personalize your books. That's going to be happening at the table where my coworker Bex is now gesturing to. Um, it'll all make sense, and my coworker Belle is also gesturing to it. Yes, right there. Um, we ask that you please grab all your personal belongings, line up down the center aisle, and curve around to the wall. I know there are also many of you who want to say your hellos and express your love to Alice, but if you could wait until we get her settled behind there, that would be fantastic. And then 
shower her with all the compliments you want. <laughs> okay, <laughs> that's all we have tonight. Let's give these two one last round of applause. Thank you all again. <laughs>